Mr. Chair, our population is aging rapidly. And as we age, we become more susceptible to developing serious diseases. As a nation, we have become less healthy in the past decade, with a general rise in the prevalence of chronic diseases such as hypertension. Life expectancy in Singapore has improved over the last 10 years. Seniors are increasingly living alone, and this trend is expected to continue as our population ages and average household size decreases. For all these reasons and others, the strain on individuals and their families and the impact on our healthcare system will increase significantly in the coming years. We need to strengthen our healthcare system to meet these challenges by proactively encouraging healthier lifestyles and preventing or delaying the onset of poor health. This involves strengthening healthcare services in the community, closer to individuals' everyday environment, and leveraging our extensive network of family doctors and community partners as necessary. While we continue to invest in building new healthcare infrastructure, upgrading the existing infrastructure, we're also expanding our primary and community care services. Studies have shown that individuals with a regular family doctor experience better health outcomes, including fewer hospitalizations and emergency department visits. Beyond managing our acute and chronic illnesses, the primary care team also plays a vital role in preventing the onset of serious illnesses. An ongoing relationship with a regular doctor allows for deeper understanding and familiarity with patients' medical conditions, sensitivities to medications and foods, and the day-to-day -day lives of the patient. This results ultimately in better care. Mr. Ang Weineng asked about plans to build more polyclinics to cater to the increasing demands of our aging population, particularly in the Western region. There are 25 polyclinics and over 1,000 healthier SGGP clinics today. By 2030, we will have 32 polyclinics, and we hope to have more healthier SGGP clinics. There will be three new polyclinics in the Western region. One in Tengah will be completed in 2025, another in UT by 2027, and the third in Taman Jurong by 2028. The existing Clementi Polyclinic and Jurong Polyclinic will also be redeveloped by 2030 to increase their capacities. I agree with Dr. Tan Wu Meng on the need to ensure adequate accessibility between polyclinics and major transportation nodes. For the redeveloped Clementi Polyclinic, MOH has worked with LTA to ensure that sheltered pedestrian access will be provided between the building and Clementi MRT's nearest exit, save for the junction across Clementi Avenue 3, where such shelters will not be practical because the junction is wide and there are double-decker buses passing through. So, as our society ages, we need to ensure that seniors' social and health needs are adequately supported in the community. Having strong social support networks have been shown to contribute to better health outcomes. This is particularly important for seniors who live alone and are at risk of social isolation. Active aging centers will collaborate with healthcare providers, including family doctors, as well as work with other community providers and government agencies for active aging programs. In addition to physical health, we also need to look after our mental health. At the Parliament motion on advancing mental health last month, this House recognized the importance of mental health as a health, social, and economic issue and affirm the importance of a robust national mental health ecosystem to enhance mental health and well-being. Mr. Keith Chua asked about key areas that the National Mental Health Office will be focusing on. The office is expected to be fully established by 2025, comprising officers from MOH, the Ministry of Social and Family Development, MSF, and the Ministry of Education, MOE. It will oversee the implementation of various plans under the National Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy and shape the development of future mental health initiatives, building upon previous efforts such as the National Mental Health Blueprint and the Community Mental Health Master Plan. Under the office, we will scale up mental health services in the primary and community care settings and strengthen access to community-based care. Specifically, initial plans include building the competencies of professionals and frontline personnel. We will, we will include staff in religious organizations to support persons with mental health needs to address Dr. Juan Rizal's questions about involving religious organizations in community mental health support.
Other plans include promoting early access, early care access through publicizing key mental health first stop touch points and ensuring better care coordination among service providers through the development of a practice guide. The office will also track indicators to monitor the progress and outcomes of these plans as reflected in the National Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy Report. While persons with severe mental health conditions may seek psychiatric care at hospitals, those with mild to moderate mental health symptoms would benefit more from care delivered in the community as compared to being institutionalized for treatment or being removed from their daily routines and their social networks. Dr. Said Harun asked if mental health will be a focus of healthier SG implementation plans. Let me elaborate on how we're scaling up mental health services in the primary and community care settings. Today, 19 out of the existing 25 polyclinics provide mental health services. In addition, over 450 GPs have been trained, <clears throat> trained to support persons with mental health needs under the Mental Health General Practitioner Partnership. To bring mental health services closer to where individuals live, we will expand mental health support in all polyclinics and healthier SG cl clinics by 2030. MOH will also be developing mental health protocols and incorporating mental health care and support as part of the scope of practice for GPs in healthier SG clinics. We will also be strengthening mental health outreach and intervention in the community. Today, we have 73 community outreach teams, CREST teams, that detect and help individuals with mental health needs. By 2030, we will expand the number of outreach teams to 90, for those who require more intensive mental health support, they can be referred to any of our 29 community intervention teams, the COMMIT teams, which will be expanded to 50 teams by 2030. These teams support GPs in the provision of psychosocial interventions for persons with mental health needs in the community. This is to also address Dr. Wan Rizal's question on what is being done to enhance the accessibility and integration of mental health services within the community. So there are critical structures and policies to support the effective delivery of preventive health care. Our primary care teams need to be suitably sized and equipped with the right skills. They also need to be adequately supported to provide team-based and integrated care through primary care networks and consultations with specialists and by leveraging on technology. Mr. Yip Hon Wing highlighted the need to ensure GPs in participating healthy rescue GP clinics have the necessary resources and expertise to effectively manage chronic conditions. Ms. Ng Ling Ling also asked how the government intends to support the professional development of GPs, especially in areas they may be increasingly involved in, such as social prescriptions to influence patients' lifestyle choices for better health outcomes and the treatment of common mental health conditions. Dr. Said Harun asked about retention plans for healthcare professionals to support healthier SG and the shift towards preventive health. MOH is working closely with institutes of high learning to increase the local training pipelines. We are also committed to the development of family doctors in primary and community care and have placed a stronger emphasis on family medicine training, such as encouraging more doctors to take up postgraduate family medicine training like the graduate diploma in family medicine and the masters of medicine in family medicine. Postgraduate training in family medicine has also been strengthened to help family doctors be better equipped to manage a wider range of complex conditions across different age groups. Training is delivered through modalities such as video conferencing and webinars, allowing GPs some flexibility as they keep up to date with the latest developments in family medicine. At the same time, we are increasing the number of nurses, pharmacists, and other allied health professionals in the community, and are providing interdisciplinary training to empower them to practice at the highest level of their licenses. We will also expand the role of community pharmacists and other allied health professionals in primary and community care to improve care delivery in the community. We will also train more lay extenders these are non-medically trained persons who can undertake tasks such as arranging the initial health screening, coordinating referrals to community programs. Healthcare professionals can then focus on clinical care. Primary care teams will be supported with healthier SG care protocols to ensure consistent quality care for patients. 
These care protocols lay out clear processes, referrals, and data flows to guide GPs in managing each health condition. 12 care protocols were released during the launch of Health RSG on the management of cro common chronic conditions such as diabetes and high cholesterol and preventive health such as smoking cessation and weight management. More care protocols will be developed to cover more chronic diseases in the future. We recognize that some GPs may have more experience in managing certain chronic conditions than others and therefore we will work closely with the College of Family Physicians Singapore the Agency for Integrated Care and the healthcare clusters to roll out training for GPs and their care teams for each care protocol. We will also support GPs in the provision of holistic care for patients with mental health needs by strengthening the links to community intervention teams for non-pharmacological mental health support. Sir, so Dr. Tan Wu Meng asked if MOH is reviewing the time required by GP clinics to deliver holistic care. As we mobilize family doctors to co-develop health plans with their patients, which can include adjustments to lifestyle and regular health screening, we expect that the percentage of patients requiring longer clinic consultations to increase. This has been taken into account when planning for future primary care capacity. To allow family doctors to focus on optimizing clinical care, we have adopted a team-based care approach in polyclinics and private GP clinics. In polyclinics, patients with chronic conditions are assigned to multidisciplinary care teams comprising family physicians, nurse care managers, and care coordinators. In private GP clinics, primary care networks, PCNs, anchor and strengthen team-based care for chronic diseases by pooling resources to organize core ancillary services provided by nurses and care coordinators who work with GPs to jointly manage the patient's conditions. The number of clinics participating in a PCN has grown from 340 clinics in 2018 to more than 1,000 clinics today. Our clusters will also step up as regional health managers, working with family doctors and other partners to address health and social needs of residents in their region and anchor care in the community. Family doctors may work with specialists or hospital doctors in the management of patients with more complex needs, for example. And upon discharge, the hospitals would refer patients to the family doctor they are enrolled with to ensure continuity of care between the hospital space and the primary care space. Dr. Syed Harun asked about systems integration plans to support Healthy RSG, to, facil to facilitate holistic, integrated, and coordinated care provided by multiple healthcare providers across hospital-based and community care settings. We need to simplify how healthcare providers access and share data. The importance of a well-integrated and reliable IT system to connect healthcare providers has been highlighted by many GPs. The National Electronic Health Record is a key tool for supporting holistic and integrated care. It serves as a centralized repository of key health information that healthcare professionals can access and can contribute to. Its capabilities will be enhanced to cater to a wider spectrum of care providers in a safe and secure manner enabling healthcare providers in different care settings to make better decisions when caring for their patients. The upcoming Health Information Bill will also establish the framework to govern the collection, access, use, and sharing of selected health information across various settings to facilitate the continuity of care. Specific to primary care, we have supported GP clinics and their IT vendors to upgrade their IT systems, to simplify administrative processes, and to improve data flows while ensuring that data sharing is secure. For example, under Healthy RSG, we have rolled out the clinic management system tiering framework for primary care to ensure that IT systems used by private GP clinics are integrated with national programs for a more seamless delivery of care. We've also enhanced our national digital health app, Health Hub, to empower residents to manage their own health. Through Health Hub, residents can enroll for Healthy RSG, view their personalized health plans, manage medical appointments, and view their health screening results and vaccination records. We plan to expand the type of health records available through Health Hub in the future. Dr. Lim Wikia and Ms. Mariam Jaffa suggested making use of technology and AI to optimize healthcare delivery for cost effectiveness and improved patient outcomes. Our healthcare institutions use proven cost-effective technology extensively to automate manual tasks 
and augment clinical decision making. For example, the outpatient pharmacy automation system helps to automate the packing and dispensing of pharmacy medication. Patients can also utilize Health Hub to arrange for medicine refills and manage their medical appointments. This all helps to reduce waiting time and enhance the patient experience. MOH is also exploring the use of AI-assisted radiology diagnosis systems for pathology detection to automate the analysis of medical images, support clinicians to identify patients with urgent care needs, and help radiologists to generate radiology reports. Dr. Wan Rizal suggested utilizing AI to improve the accessibility of mental health care. Currently, MindLine employs an AI-enabled chatbot that allows people to share their emotional struggles anonymously and guides them to self-help resources such as psychotherapy exercises and counseling services where needed. While we embrace innovation and leverage technology, patient safety remains of paramount importance. MOH will continue to evaluate these new technologies for clinical and cost effectiveness and assess their safety and suitability for various uses in our healthcare system. Ms. Mariam Jaffa asked for an update on value-based care initiatives that have been piloted and whether these initiatives have been scaled up across the healthcare system. MOH has been placing an increasing emphasis on value-based care efforts since 2015. These efforts aim to improve health outcomes while simultaneously managing the attendant cost increases in a sustainable way. These initiatives range from national system initiatives to programs that target individual doctors and specific procedures. Since the implementation of the Cancer Drug List, the CDL, which focused on MediShield Life and integrated Shield Plan coverage on clinically proven and cost-effective cancer drug treatments, CDL drug prices in the public sector have been brought down by an average of 30% and over 60% for some drugs. This has allowed us to subsidize more drugs and improve affordability. In the long run, we expect this to moderate the costs of cancer drugs. We are shifting our focus more upstream and are applying value-based care to payment models like capitation and preventive efforts through Healthier SG. Sir, it will be a long-term, multi-year effort to work towards a healthier population. The government and healthcare providers will provide quality health care to residents, but individual responsibility is crucial. Each of us must take charge of our own health, adopt healthier behaviours, build relationships with our family doctors, and proactively manage any chronic diseases. Concurrently, health care providers will reorientate towards preventive care, while the government sets up systems, programmes, and incentives to support health care providers in delivering care to residents in the community. In the future, through the government's efforts in strengthening preventive care and a shift in residents' health-seeking behaviour, the aim is for all of us to visit a regular family doctor as a first point of contact and for ongoing support to holistically manage our own health. Consistent and evidence-based care will be delivered across a diverse primary care landscape, and all of us can take proactive steps to keep to a personalised health plan. Together, all of us, everyone, can play a part in improving our health. Thank you, sir.